STEM fans, are you ready? Let's hear it for the world-class NASA STEM Stars team. From NASA centers across the country, we present astronaut Douglas Wheelock. Hello and welcome to this special episode of NASA STEM Stars. I'm Jen Hudgens coming to you from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Obviously, I'm not at Space Center. I'm from home, but so are all of us. And this is a very special edition because we're going to be announcing the winner of our challenge of the Ride to Station Challenge from the NASA Virtual Social Looking forward to announcing those winners. There are so many good codes submitted, and I can't wait to share with you who the winner is. We also have a very special guest today that's going to be announcing that winner. Um, the purpose of our NASA STEM Stars episodes and webinars is to introduce students to our NASA stars that are working in the STEM fields. Could it be engineers or astronauts like we have today? And we want to be able to understand what it takes to do those careers and how to get to where they are from where you are as a student. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Doug Wheelock. He is a NASA astronaut with a lot of experience. And I wanna remind you all that if you have any questions, please put those in the chat window um, and we will get to as many of those as possible. So we're gonna go ahead and meet Doug we're going to explore what his career is like, how he got to where he is, answer some questions, and then we're going to announce our winner, and then I'm going to tell you what our next episode will be about. So without further ado, uh, Doug Wheels Wheelock. Welcome to the show, Doug. How are you today? Thanks, uh, Jen. Uh, doing great. Thank you for the invite, and hello to all the STEM stars out there, and uh, just uh, ordinary kids with extraordinary dreams. Uh, welcome to, uh, it's just such a pleasure to join you today and a privilege to talk about my, my pathway to, uh, to the stars. Yeah, so let's, let's talk about uh, your pathway. Um, how, did, how did you get to where you are? Where are you from? What's your degrees? What do you like to do in your free time? There's so much that we want to know about you. So interesting thing, I, I grew up in upstate New York in a tiny little town and um, a very small town, actually a very rural area. And, and now, even to this day, there's like dairy farms and apple orchards up that way. And um, I went to a very, very small school, but I was a little boy when we put, first put people on the moon. And so um, I went into class that next year. Of course, that was in July. And so it was during our summer break. And I thought to myself, I remembered watching it on that little black and white TV and uh, thought to myself, gosh, the world is going to change as we know but it. We looked at those uh, people walking on the moon as ex like superheroes, like ex extraordinary people from extraordinary places. And so when I went into school, I was in elementary school at the time, I had a brand new teacher that came in that next school year. Her name was Christine West. And uh, she was from the big city of Albany, New York, which is our state capital there. And she came to this little country school. And um, we always joked with her that she probably came there to pay penance for her education degree. But she came to this little country school, and um, the first day of class, she said, who saw the moon landing? And I, of course, I raised my hand, and she said, one day you could do that too. And we all thought, like, this lady's crazy. She has no idea where she is in this tiny little school with these extraordinary, these ordinary little kids from ordinary places. Uh, she surely doesn't know what, she, what she's talking about. And I, I thought that for many years, and then as I went along, I began to reflect back on those words as I was going through my career. And I thought, I wonder if Miss West was right. I wonder if just ordinary kids like me could go to or go to the moon or what have you. And uh, it was years later uh, when I was selected as an astronaut in 1998, many years later, um, I came, uh, to, I got a chance to meet Neil Armstrong and I had been an astronaut for three days, and I had a brand new flight suit. And, um, and 
and I had we had dinner set up and I sat at a table next to Neil Armstrong and my knees were shaking you know because I kept thinking back you know I wasn't I, I wasn't uh, you know I, I knew the awe-inspiring uh, uh, feat of that first step on the moon but I reflected back on my childhood and I thought to myself what am I gonna ask Neil Armstrong you know he's a superhero an extraordinary person and I asked him, I said, Mr. Armstrong, when you were on the moon, did you get a moment just to sort of reflect on what a profound moment it was in human history? He said, you know, I, I did. I had so much breath. He said, I thought about those engineers that built that rocket that got us there. And I was hoping when we pushed that button, we would launch to go back home to Earth. And I thought about my teachers. I thought about my family. And I thought to myself, how does an ordinary boy from Wapa, Canada, we all laughed, and I thought, huh, that's a familiar story. I said, that's my story, and, and the reality is that's the story for all of us. All of us out there, we're all just ordinary kids from ordinary places with these extraordinary dreams of where our career and our preparation can take us where we can meet up with those extraordinary opportunities in life. And so I'm here to give you the message is like, you're an ordinary kid, just like me, just like Neil Armstrong. So all these things are available to us if we just put in the preparation and prepare our lives to intersect with extraordinary opportunities. It all began at a very young age for me. So That is awesome. And I love hearing your experience about how it was a teacher that made you think about that. You know, teachers are going through an extraordinary time right now with not being able to sit in the classroom with their students and have those kinds of conversations. So that's um, very inspiring to me as a teacher that one touched your heart and made you inspire, aspire to be something greater than you ever thought you could be. So Absolutely. that means a lot to me and I'm sure other educators out there as well. I think we have a slide that shows a little bit about your journey that maybe Joshua put up. Um, sure, the there's the one. Yeah. I, I see that slide up there and there. Uh, um, I started out, I uh, went to West Point um, and got a bachelor's degree in applied science and engineering. So it was, it was sort of a broad range of, of things. And that was, that's going to be my first message to the STEM stars listening in is to find something you love to do. Uh, first of all, you need to start out with a curious mind and a heart full of wonder. And so if you do that, if you open your mind and you open your heart to all the possibilities uh, that are there for you as well, and then discover something that you love. And I, at a young age, I, I loved uh, just sort of figuring out how things worked. And so that's sort of the life of an engineer is how, how to take something and build it better or maybe make modify it to work better and figure out how it works and be able to take it apart, fix it, and put it back together. So um, I started out in engineering and then uh, I went to the military academy. And so I was in the, a career aviator in the, in the Army aviation. And, and um, I know that there are a lot of uh, young STEM stars out there that don't want to be in the military, that maybe want to uh, uh, go a different track. And that's perfectly great. You know, those in those early days when we selected the original astronauts, most of them had a military background because we sort of understood that as a as a tr good training ground for leadership and and um, and uh, being able to overcome stressful situations. And now, and but now the astronaut uh, corps uh, that we have is predominantly made up of civilian scientists and engineers um, and researchers. And so, um, so and we do still have military pilots and military uh, engineers as well. And so. Um, so if you're not interested in the military background, that was my journey, but, um, but it's certainly not a requirement to be an astronaut. And so I went on to Georgia Tech. Uh, I started flying helicopters and, um, and then uh, worked all my, uh, my way through fixed wing and onto test pilot school. And I began to wonder, it's like, huh, I wonder if I could really get to the stars like my teacher, Miss West, uh, told me so many years years ago, you know, I just wanted to fly. I had the dream of flying. And so my, my journey to being becoming an astronaut was more of sort of a logical progression through my flying career. So um, if these are things that you're interested in, um, uh, the, uh, 
these paths are open for you as well. The key is uh, approach life with a curious mind and an open heart full of wonder uh, about the world around you. And then find something you love to do and then work and study so hard in that area uh, that you live your life with passion and then you live your life with so much passion that people can't take their eyes off of you. And so that's a real key in reaching the very heights of, uh, of the profession you choose for yourself. Can you share with the students what it's like to be an astronaut, how you train to be one? Sure. Um, well, you know, the, the interesting thing I like to say to, um, to students everywhere is I, I've been an astronaut for about 21 years, and I, but I've been in space for about six months. So, and so you think like, huh, you know, because when you think about being an astronaut, it's more of like a, prof it's, it's, it's the journey is in the becoming. Um, in fact, when I first got to NASA as an astronaut, it was nine years. I trained for nine years uh, before I got a chance to fly into space. And, um, and so the day in the life of an astronaut is living this life that I just described for you. Um, finding you're, you, you'll be selected as an astronaut or an engineer by NASA purely in the field that you've demonstrated your passion in. And so um, my journey is going to be different than yours, but it might be similar to someone else that's in the astronaut corps as well. And so the day in the life of an astronaut is, um, is uh, keeping your eyes on the stars and overcoming challenges and helping NASA to solve problems. And, um, you know, uh, we in this journey of what we're doing in space and how we're, we're in this race to get back to the moon and onto Mars, um, there's people listening in right now that are going to be the first people stepping foot on Mars. And um, I don't know who they are, but they're probably some, they may even be listening to this, uh, to this cast. And so um, if you're out there and have that, uh, that dream as a goal, uh, that's certainly something you can achieve. That's great. So there's not one path to being an astronaut. Yeah. There's numerous ways. So that's, that's, that's that could be encouraging for some. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we talk about the STEM fields, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. And those are certainly the areas, the main areas that we draw our scientists uh, and our engineers and our test pilots from uh, those areas. We also now have included A in the STEM. So for the arts, uh, so we call it STEAM sometimes as well, because we have uh, the art of uh, the art of psychology, the art of design. All of these things are becoming hugely important as we design new spacesuits, uh, new spacecraft, as we design the uh, the human factors involved in uh, in building the inside of a spacecraft, where you're going to be isolated for maybe a period of months, uh, maybe getting to Mars or what have you. So. So we, we include all of the uh, all of those disciplines in the STEM areas and also in the areas of the arts in uh, in design and um, in psychology as well. Well, we've gotten a couple questions. You feel like fielding a couple of those? We got some excited sure. students out there. Um, sure. What excites you most about space? Oh boy, um, it, it's just you know it's. Uh, for me, it was just a dream of, of uh, being a part of something much bigger than myself. And, um, and so the thing that excites me the most is, is uh, we're always pushing the boundaries at NASA uh, to what we, what we think is possible. And so, you know, back in the early days, even when the Wright brothers came along, they said, one day we're going to fly like birds and everybody thought they were crazy, right? So. Um, but now we celebrate flight, and now it's a, a dream for a lot of us that um, uh, the, you know, in the, I love uh, giving talks in uh, North Carolina or, or in Ohio as well, because in North Carolina, the license plates on all the cars down there say, North Carolina, first in flight. But in Ohio, it says Ohio, birthplace of aviation, because the original thought, the original uh, concept of, of the of the dream of flight really came to life with the Wright brothers so many years ago. The same is true with flying in space. It's like, you know, people came along and said, you know, we're gonna put people uh, in outer space and people thought you're crazy, you can't do that. There's no air up there to breathe. But we had these dreams of how we can 
how we can sustain life and how we can thrive as as humans uh, in space, living and working in space. And by virtue of doing that, the magic of NASA comes along, which isn't magic at all, but it's but it's the idea of taking a spark of an idea and make it become revolutionary, sometimes in a completely different area of science. And we have just the history, our space history is replete with these examples of um, how we've taken just a spark of an idea and NASA kind of nurtures that and it becomes revolutionary in the way we, uh, the way we live our lives. You know, we're, you're probably listening on a device, a, com a computing device of some sort um, that was the, the genesis of those things uh, were in the development of our, of our uh, equipment to go to space. And so a lot of it, and all of what we're doing on the space station, all of our science, all of our research is to bring that back safely and effectively to the earth to make life better here. Because our, our end goal at NASA is to, is to help you take better care of yourself, help you take better care, of, help us all to take you better care of each other and help us all to take better care of our planet. That's all about what we're doing, all the science we're doing on the space station. Um, what's the scariest part of launching into space? So we haven't talked too much about that, that how that feels like to be on the top of a rocket. Can you share that experience with us? The scariest part, I was gonna ask Josh if you could queue up uh, my shuttle launch. I think I have a video of my shuttle launch on the space shuttle Discovery in 2007. Minus 16 seconds, South Suppression there, Water uh, System has been uh, activated. Protecting the Discovery and the launch pad I'll from the sound of the engines roaring to life here. So. We have a well, go from the engine start. This, T minus five, this four, three, two, those engines one, and um, booster ignition and ride. liftoff you of discovery. Like, you feel like you're chained down, and all of a sudden those chains are broken, and you just sort of loop off the planet. Um, it only takes about eight and a half minutes, nine minutes to get to space, and so um, it's quite a ride um, uphill. This is my ride on the space shuttle. And uh, inside, all these things were running through my mind. Um, what's, you know, making sure that um, I'm watching all the switches and circuit breakers and the screens and the, and, and, and the feedback from the space shuttle, what's happening on the trajectory and things. And so a lot of things running through your mind. Uh, but the way that we train in, um, in the rocket or at NASA is we train for, we train to know and feel and see uh, what failure looks like. And so NASA is the only place I've ever worked where we practice failure on a daily basis. Um, and the reason we do that is we want to be ready. So when that moment comes along, we're ready. It's almost like taking the ordinary and being ready for the extraordinary. And so the very uh, same thing happens when you're on a rocket. And then eight, or eight and a half, nine minutes later, you're in space and everything's floating. I remember on that shuttle launch, I everything was floating, the engines cut off, I took my helmet off and I, I floated it right here in front of me, I floated my gloves right there in front of me, and it was a euphoric feeling of just floating around and being in weightlessness. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience. That sounds absolutely incredible. I hope all of us get to experience that someday, that feeling. Mm -hmm. We've had some questions that are very similar um, to each other, like what kind of training did you have? Did you have to learn Russian and how much? Um, how difficult, what's the most difficult thing you've had to do as an astronaut? So these are all kind of related to your training. Sure. Um, actually, for me, the, one of the hardest parts was to, uh, my second launch was on the, um, on, this, on the Russian Soyuz. I don't know if Josh can maybe bring that up with a little bit of sound, and I'll talk over it. But it was uh, three years later after I got back from space, I went on a six-month mission. This is my uh, Russian Soyuz launch. A little bit, quite a bit different experience than launching on the shuttle. And, um, and some of the training you have to go through to launch on this Soyuz, um, the hardest part for me was learning Russian because you have to speak and, and operate your procedures and all the equipment on board the Soyuz. Um, it's all written in Russian. And so, um, and to be able to communicate with mission control in Moscow as well. So. That was the hardest part for me, really, was to learn the Russian because the, the rocketry and the experience that I had on the space shuttle in space um, really paid dividends when I got to my um, my mission, my six-month mission, because I when I got to space, I was able to do three spacewalks 
on my space shuttle mission. And then during the summer of 2010, uh, three years later, I was able to do three more spacewalks. And uh, just getting that and building on that experience um, has helped me be able to pass that torch uh, to the um, earlier career astronauts now that are coming along that are on the space station. So a lot of that training is underwater. We spend a lot of time underwater. I think I may have an, an, a photo of, um, of uh, me being lowered into the, um, into the water. We practice our, um, there's a, you can see up on your screen, uh, we practice our spacewalks um, underwater because um, we still have gravity underwater, but we, we can make ourselves neutrally buoyant. So in the, in the water column, as you're working on your task, you feel like you're floating. And so it gives you the sensation of being in space uh, that picture that you see on, on the far right of your screen is me uh, doing an emergency spacewalk in 2010. I had to ride on the end of this uh, uh, robotic arm. And so there I'm out in the blackness of space. And um, it was kind of it's kind of scary being out there. One thing that you can't simulate is um, in that robotic arm, you're actually floating in your suit. And so you can't actually feel your feet in the bottom of your boots. And so it's kind of an uneasy feeling when you're kind of riding along and you're just floating inside of your suit as well. So uh, a lot of training, a lot of the training that we do, we practice uh, things malfunctioning and things, we try to think of what's the wor next worst thing that can happen. And we plan out our simulations uh, by failing. And then we, because we wanna know what that feels like. That's, as humans, that's our biggest, one of our biggest fears is the fear of failure. That's why. A lot of times we don't try new things because we're afraid of failing or what have you. But you look at all the great inventors over the time, you know, the Wright brothers, uh, Thomas Edison, all these great inventors, um, they failed time and time again and learned from their failures. And so we practice that at NASA. So when the day comes, uh, when we actually have a failure in space, um, uh, we, we're ready for it. Well, as you know, the challenge that we, uh put forth to students is um, a ride to station challenge where they had to write a code about um, docking to the International Space Station. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what that's like as you have finally launched mm -hmm. off the Earth and you've escaped that gravity and you're starting to float, but now you've got a new task ahead of you. You've actually that's got right. to attach to your new home. So what was that like? That's right, it's, and it's, it's really kind of a fine dance. We're actually orbiting the Earth at 17,500 miles per hour. So that's about five miles per second, eight kilometers per second. So if you can imagine that, we're trying, it's like a faster than a bullet. We're trying to, so we launch into the space station. So the space station comes over and we have a very short launch window to be able to catch up and rendezvous with the space station. So we actually have to match our speed with the space station, which is which is very, very difficult, but we have computers on board uh, that calculate these trajectories. And then I remember catching up uh, in, this, in the space shuttle, catching up to the space station. I remember looking through the, uh, uh, the reticle as the, at first it looked like just a bright star. And as, as we got closer, I thought, I thought to myself, wow, it's so amazing. Um, it was just, almost as big as a football field, you know, and you could see the solar arrays and everything. It was just like being in a movie or in a dream or something. And so, uh, but then, you know, you, you kind of line up your sights with the, uh, we have, actually have a reticle with like, sort of like a bullseye. And we, we bring in the, um, the docking port into our site and then we do slow uh, pulses as, as we come in and, and correct uh, to be able to dock. And so we try to make it as smooth as possible in fact, uh, when I was on the space station in 2010, uh, during our um, uh, during my six-month mission, whenever we had a ship docking, whether it was a Soyuz bringing people up, or just a resupply craft with new supplies and food, and th I would go just before it's ready to dock. I would go listen. I'd put my ear on the on the hull of the hatch, and I could hear the mechanical latches click in. You know, as it docked at the station, it was. It's quite amazing uh, opportunity. It's sort of like uh, throwing the football or kicking a soccer ball uh, to someone, like passing or passing a basketball, what have you. 
So if you have a if you're a quarterback or something in football, and you have your runner uh, running across the field as fast as they can, when you throw to them, uh, you don't throw right at where they are now. You throw at where they're going to be when the ball gets there, right? So the perfect pass will match up with the with the receiver. We have to do the very same thing uh, with the space station and the space shuttle or the Soyuz. And uh, coming up next week, the SpaceX vehicle uh, that we're going to be sending up uh, on our crew, uh, our commercial crew. So we have to do the very same thing. So we have to wait to the space station's just right, and then we launch uh, to intercept the space station's trajectory. So That's awesome. Uh, we probably have about time for maybe one more question. So um, has your outlook on life changed since going to space? It, it really has, and actually, um, my and my experience in space has really helped me. Um, and I, I have a couple of pointers for you guys, all of us that are now quarantined or isolated in our in our homes. Um, uh, the, you know, some of the things I learned in space. Uh, um, you know, I I used to dream when I was a little boy. Um, I used to dream about what it would be like to live on another planet or to travel to another planet. Uh, and be on Mars or, you know, Pluto. Pluto was my favorite planet when I was a kid. Who thinks Pluto should still be a planet? Um, I'm, I'm with you, but, uh, and we all saw those beautiful images of Pluto that we, our NASA New Horizons mission sent back just about four years ago or so, four or five years ago. And, uh, but anyway, when I was a kid, I used to dream about what this would be like. And then when I got to space, um, I looked out at our planet and, um, and the feelings of isolation and separation uh, become very real after just a short period of time on the station. And so um, I began to think to myself, you know, it's like, you know, Earth is now my favorite planet. Because I, I thought to myself, had I been a kid on Mars or something, you know, and had a telescope and could look out in the night sky and see this beautiful image. I don't know if uh, Josh could bring up some images of... Uh, I got some daytime images and some nighttime images of the of the Earth, but the Earth during the daylight hours we're orbiting we're orbiting once uh, every 90 minutes, and so every every 45 minutes we get a sunrise or a sunset, and each one of them just more beautiful than the one previous. It's just it just takes your breath away, and um, and when you experience this, I began to think to myself, you know, in the daylight, the Earth is like an explosion of color. There's a good image there. Um, it's like an explosion of color in this vast empty sea of darkness. And then at night, you could see the city lights, the, mo the mosaic of the city lights on our, and you could see the aurora, and you could see, uh, um, you could see lightning strikes on the earth. And I thought to myself, had I been a little boy on Mars or something, and could take my telescope and look out into the distant sky, night sky, and see this beautiful planet, this beautiful blue planet that's glowing with color in the in the daylight in the sun and then just raging with light at night you know it, it would be how much more vivid my dreams would be to be on another planet looking at earth so earth is now my favorite planet and so when i came back um when i came back it gave me a new appreciation for uh because living up there for six months there's a lot of things that are absent that we sort of take for granted um and I'm thinking mostly like sounds and smells of the earth. Um, and I call them evidence of life because on the space station, we recycle everything. We recycle our breathing air, we recycle our water. In fact, we have a joke on the space station that yesterday's coffee is tomorrow's coffee. So <laughs> let that sink in a little bit. Enjoy your coffee while we discuss. No, but uh, but um, Everything, you, and you feel like you're on life support on the space station. And so it made me appreciate um, simple things in life, like the sound of rain um, and the smell of the earth after the rain and um, the feel of water, uh, rain on my skin, and um, the sound of birds, uh, the sound of wind through the leaves of a tree or through the forest or something, you know. It was, those things are all absent in space. And so, and your your body, the human mind and the human psyche begins to crave those things. And so those are the things I was missing the most, you know, other friends and family, of course, but um, I was just missing that uh, connection to the planet. And so um, 
it really has changed my uh, my viewpoint on uh, life here on Earth as well. So I don't waste a day anymore. Then, and when it rains, I go outside. My wife thinks I'm crazy, but uh, but uh, uh, I go outside and enjoy the rain. Usually, just kind of sometimes I just stand in the light rain. So. That is so awesome, Wheels. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. I know you've inspired me, and so you must have inspired and um, many, many others, especially of our students, helped us appreciate life a little bit more than what we have here on Earth. Um, we need to announce the winner of our Ride to Station Challenge. So um, we had a challenge that lasted for about a week. Students wrote code and submitted it through our social media plans. And we actually have two um, that we chose. There's a beginning um, code that was written and an advanced code. So, Wheels, if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing with us who we've chosen as our winners, maybe the advanced first, and then we'll talk uh, to the beginner. Okay, happy to do that, uh, Jen. So the advanced group, if you're ready, a little drum roll, a little virtual drum roll. Lokesh Narwhal. Lokesh Narwhal. So if you're listening in, you're the winner in the advanced group. And, I believe uh, he was a, he's a follower on our virtual NASA social. So we'll get in Perfect. touch with him. Yep. Perfect. Congratulations, uh, Lokesh. And our beginning uh, submission, I have as a Twitter handle. So listen up for your Twitter handle. The beginning submission, the beginner submission is at Shreya30. So that's at S H R I A A three zero Shreya thirty. So congratulations. Perfect. Thank you, Wheels. And we'll be in touch with those students and we will be making sure that everybody that participated will also get a participation certificate. So we'll reach out to those winners and thanks again. We, uh, thanks again, Wheels. We hope to see you again on another maybe NASA Stars uh, webinars uh, in the near future. Absolutely. Thank you for having me join you. I really appreciate the invite and I wish everyone's uh, safety and ha happiness and health uh, in their quarantine and, um, and uh, make, it, make it something that's, uh, that's a positive thing for you. You can, you can not only survive, you can thrive in quarantine and uh, trust me, you can do this and, uh, and um, just build a, a structure for yourself, set goals for yourself each day uh, to get through and when we emerge stronger people and stronger families, I look forward to getting together with you uh, for real and uh, maybe even for a, a, a space vehicle launch from the Florida coast and, um, and happy to join you on, uh, on future events like this as well. So thank you and take care. All right, thanks. And next time, uh, students, our next uh, NASA STEM stars will be actually tomorrow because today was just a special episode. But stay tuned tomorrow to find out how NASA uses virtual reality when they're training their astronauts. It'll be at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on NASA STEM's YouTube channel. Again, we'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.